The following is a presentation of the Four Center podcast feed. From the center of the galaxy, this is the Four Center podcast feed, and this particular episode is Cues of the Force, Quotidian of the Force. No. It's questions of the force. We've got questions and we've got some answers, but we have even more A's as well. I'm Joseph Scrimshaw. I'm Ken Napsuck. You know more Q words than me. I'm going to study up on Q words, (laughs) Um, but hey, we got answers. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I, I know most words uh, from villains like Doctor Doom saying them in yes. comic books, and I had to be like, "What is this?" And my mom and dad would be like, I, I, "I don't, I don't know. You got to look that one up in the dictionary, kid. Sure. I don't know what Didion means." Uh, anyway, uh, happy memories of of a youth full of Doctor Doom dictionary. Anyway, uh, one of the A's that we want to share is Audible. Today's podcast is brought to you by Audible. Get a free audiobook download and a 30-day free trial at audibletrial.com slash four center. Over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player. We are continuing to recommend Battle Scars by Sam Maggs, a book that is continuing the adventures of Cal Kestis, Marin, and Friends, uh, I assume we haven't read it yet, but we're looking forward to it. And if you want to give it a listen and help us out, you can download a free audiobook today by going to audibletrial.com slash four center. One more time, that's audibletrial.com slash four center for a free audiobook. Our third A. No, hey, I lost track of my A's. Our second A. The third A is answers. Our second A, Ken, is mm-hmm. asks. You want to take this one? I do. I got this A. I got it down pat. Hey, folks, we are asking you to maybe consider. If you want to find it in your heart, check out our Patreon page at patreon.com slash four center. This is a great way to support us directly. Keeps uh, keeps the show going, which is a good catchphrase. But like I always joke, Joseph and I will do this show if we're recording in some tin cans in a bunker. All right, don't worry about that. But it helps uh, us accomplish some wonderful things, set goals, and reach them. And one of those things recently was Indiana Jones and the Perilous Podcast. The first episode dropped on Monday, March 20th. It's exclusive to Patreon members now at any level. It will go to the public. We will let you know about that. It goes to the public after Dial of Destiny. we got this great series that we're in the middle of recording. Uh, so if you want to join us on the journey to Dial of Destiny, a.k.a. Indy 5, uh, in late June, um, well, that's just a, this is a great way to do it. Also, we have this new goal. A what, uh, work, The working title is Jennifer Landa's YouTube series because, uh, you know, she has some choices. Uh, back in the day, here's a long story short. Back in the day when the podcast started, Jen did this wonderful series of shows called Jedi Beat. And that kind of morphed into another wonderful idea, which, by the way, was an early Patreon goal. Happy Beeps. And these are wonderful mini docs. NPR meets Star Wars. It's Jennifer just, I think, at her absolute best. Some of the best stuff produced here for the podcast. And if we reach this goal of $2,000 a month, we're oh so close. We are going to be able to take that and and reinvest back into the podcast and uh, the channel by uh, converting, taking those old uh, episodes that, I mean, 2015, they're hard to find, and repurposing <laughs> as uh, video docs, Jen's Really excited about not just pictures over them, but other things she might do. She might re-record some things. She's uh, thrilled. And um, in order to make this happen, we're asking us, uh, asking you to help us uh, reach our goal over on patreon.com slash force center. That's a lot to the ask, Joseph. It's a big <laughs> A, but hey, that's okay. It is uh, an important one to us. It will really help us uh, do more and keep going. Uh, with his support and, and create uh, new things as well. We have a ton of, uh, of very generous supporters, long-term generous supporters, but a thing that's been uh, making me happy is I've been seeing uh, people jump in at $2. We want it to be a community. We have almost everything that we offer <laughs> is available to everybody because we want it to be a community. So we're really happy to see more people joining that Patreon community, getting access to the Discord where you can have uh, safe, fun, friendly chats about Star Wars. Hey, speaking about chatting about Star Wars, we've got some cues to A. Shall we dive in? Oh, I'd love the Q and A. Or A a Q? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Let's A a Q. Uh, we have two questions from Twitter and two from Hey, our patrons on Patreon, as always. We're going to go first to Twitter. This comes to us from Victor. Uh, Victor says, when I read the Alphabet Squadron trilogy, I struggled with Mon Mothma's dismantling the Rebellion fleet so the New Republic would not have its own fleet. In Mando's last episode, we have the confirmation. What are your thoughts on her ultra-pacifism in this convulsed period? 
Uh, that's the question. I should add some context that we have a couple of questions that are along these lines. A lot of really great questions being raised by that most recent episode of The Mandalorian with the, the push into telling the story of the era, the story of the New Republic, where they might have gone uh, right, where they might have gone wrong. And uh, I'm happy to dive into it. It's also kind of fascinating territory, Ken. And I want to start here. I think that um, a lot of the decisions that the New Republic made, we have a question later about sort of the uh, the history of people on Coruscant's alignment <laughs> with different mm. organizations. Uh, this stuff is fascinating to talk about because it really is Star Wars, but mm. it is also the heart of what Lucas started Star Wars as, is mm -hmm. fun, mythic, tapping into all sorts of tales, but also young fiery political george lucas's opinions about how government should and should not work so uh i, I just want to be aware of like uh, some of the stuff we're talking about is definitely analyzing star wars but it's hard also to not talk about without starting to tip into what do we think a government should do mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. how do you feel about that balances we're getting into that that this great nuanced storytelling of the new republic and the choices and how much of it feels to you like Star Wars and how much of it starts to feel to you like um, reflecting personal philosophy of militarization and things like that. This one specifically is a wonderful challenge to me where I, I look at it from both ways. And I have since the aftermath novels where a lot of this stuff was kind of first introduced, the Bloodline novel as well. I think more specifically because because Leia and Mothma's relationship was explored there, Alphabet Squadron as well. So it's been around for a while. And and. You know, I agree with you. It, it, it's going to bleed over. Uh, I think George wanted it to bleed, bleed over, even not in specific ways. He didn't need you to, you know, spit the name of Nixon out of your mouth in 77, but he wanted you to think stuff about the real world <laughs> that you learned. <laughs> that word. It definitely was there. So it always comes up. Uh, we do like to preface it a little bit. Of course, we also should say, you know, this episode coming out after the next episode of Mando. So maybe Mon Mothma stands up. Maybe we get Genevieve O'Reilly and Mando <laughs> after four and she goes, let's go to war. And everything's uh, tossed aside there. But uh, yeah, no, um, I'm ready to dive in uh, to the complicated uh, waters. Yeah, let's dive into the complicated waters and uh, acknowledge that they're complicated, but still have some fun splashing mm -hmm. around. Um, one thing that I wanted to, to look up is... Uh, my own understanding of the New Republic's fleet. Uh, mm -hmm. And this is a great uh, clarifying content on uh, on Wikipedia, uh, which reaffirms some stuff that, that we've read in books, but it's it's been a while. Uh, and is in The Force Awakens. Here's what they say about the New Republic defense fleet. 30 years after the Battle of Endor, it was still the largest military force in the galaxy, but mm. nevertheless was a fraction of of the size of the Republic Navy during the Clone Wars. A substantial portion of the Starfleet was stationed in the Hosnian system when the system was targeted and destroyed by the First Order's Starkiller base super weapon. Hundreds of cruisers and frigates were destroyed during the attack, crippling the New Republic defense forces. Uh, Wikipedia also discusses how, like, yeah, there are absolutely, you know, fighter pilots, like uh, the great Joss C. Striker, <laughs> mm -hmm. um, it, you know, and hey, that's Poe's whole story. He gets trained by Wedge in the New Republic, you know, defense fleet, um, that the fighter pilots defense fleet exists. So the question in the New Republic era is the scale of it and the way it's being deployed. And I think that's also the story that, that Leia is saying, Hey, there's this rising threat and we are not set up to respond to it correctly. Uh, so I wanted to give that information to kind of frame our conversation. Now let's finally get to some A's. I want to hear your thoughts. First of all, that's a great info because if you just pass through this conversation, it is kind of like, well, why did Mothma completely gut the military? That's not the case. You just said it. There's a fact. It's still, the largest out and about. It's just a fraction of what it was. So I'll start here. Uh, I'll dump, uh, dump, dump, dump it all on the table like puzzle pieces we're going to put together. Philosophically, I have always agreed with it once it was introduced. I really get what Star Wars, it's it's quite a statement from Star Wars, this thing, this tension you always talk about, uh, Star Wars, and, and, and it's cool. It's pew, pew, pew. But it might be, you know, warning against it at times or analyzing why why we got those wars. And that's fair. Uh, so for me, it, it, it makes sense when I pull back and separate a little bit from my own realities because my gut reaction, 
obviously some of my background or job or even points of view from days gone by, I, I, I didn't necessarily agree with it. It's kind of this, well, but who else is out there? Uh, why would you do that? You just went through all this stuff. And then I think if I separate that and pull back and put myself in Mon Mothma's shoes as best I can, um, I don't, I couldn't feel them. She's, she's way better than me, but uh, you know, <laughs> looking at it from respect, they, they, they form, remember even just the clones, the clones are a military creation act, right? It's, mm-hmm. it's a byproduct of that. Uh, forget the cypher deus of it all and the Palpatine of it all. Just that that's what the vote was. So it, to me, this grand army didn't necessarily exist until then in different forms. We've got systems with their own, uh, maybe forces, all that. And so the purpose of that, once the civil war uh, happens is, is to overthrow Palpatine. They do. So mission accomplished in a way, let's pull back. It is a, a, to me, a message of hope that I can get behind. Um, maybe you can look at it from, uh, all right, we don't need this grand army as much as we did I- I- in the past. Uh, I know that's the grand Ar- army of the Republic, but uh, you know, so there's more power and responsibility to the ind- individual systems, uh, mm-hmm. and maybe that's part of the statement the galaxy needed. Like, hey, we all came together for this. We want to, uh, and I know now, now it sounds like we're getting into states' rights and federal rights. <laughs> real, real world blending pretty too fast. Um, but this idea of we're not going to war. Stand down a bit. Uh, raise a fist, get a fist, all those type of, type of philosophies. I think when I, when I just pull back from my own fear, which is the key word, right? If I'm in the galaxy mm-hmm. and we just went through this and I go, oh, uh, the, 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 no, we need, a, we need a new Republic Navy. Who knows what else is out there? Uh, once I release myself from that, I can get behind what Mothma's saying and what Mothma maybe did at this point in the Star Wars story. Mm-hmm. No, I'm, I'm really in agreement with you. I think, you know, it is the, the alliance to restore the Republic for the vast majority of its time. The Republic had the Jedi, uh, but they didn't have a standing army. They were brought together by unity and common purpose. That's the mm-hmm. goal of stronger together. If we all work together, it's always hard. There's always going to be bumps. There's always going to be, you know, one one system of planets needs this, but the other system of planets can't abide that. And you got to figure it out. And like, that's that's government that's living together. It's always going to be there, but we can all try to be together, right? Mm-hmm. Um versus this uh what the empire did of uh the government isn't the citizens uh the yeah. government is palpatine and he will end you if mm-hmm. you mm-hmm. uh if you defy his government and that's what that fleet was right mm-hmm. um it was there to take what palpatine wanted it wasn't there to actually defend anyone mm-hmm. um and i think so, so I think Mothma's perspective of we do not need to retain this level of militarization mm-hmm. is the general. We need to show the galaxy immediately that we are not the empire. You know, there, there's so many great uh, rumblings of that in the Mandalorian where, where different characters, particularly characters on the fringe, are afraid it's just going to be the same. Right. Yeah. So yeah. she's trying to show it is not the same. I am not a dictator. Uh, some of these decisions are not going to be entirely what I want. They're going to be compromises because I'm not mm-hmm. a dictator. Right. Um, so there's that immediate. What is Mothma thinking in that moment, in those moments in that era? It really makes sense to me. And for me, it does make sense to the general larger perspective of Star Wars. And I go exactly where you did to the prequel into uh, Padme is almost this sort of a of beacon almost this mm-hmm. this voice of the, here's how you thread the needle you want to know how to thread the needle let's look at padme right yes um the plot of attack the clones is padme and other people trying to stop the military creation act saying yep they're separatists they have they have stepped away they don't want to be a part of this there's even violence but mm-hmm. if we just totally respond with Even larger violence, it's just going to escalate and escalate and escalate. It is presented to us, the audience, is a failure that the military was created at that level. The conflict that Palpatine is is, is able to spur on spreads horror of all kinds uh, through the galaxy, pain and suffering. Uh, Padme, in the animated series Clone Wars, tries to restart negotiations, tries to stop more money being given for the creation of army and clones right Mm -hmm. um so i think there's this idea in star wars that absolutely you you raise a fist to the galaxy 
you'll get a fist back. Yeah. That isn't saying, let's just lower all of our defenses. <laughs> right, let's right. roll over and show all threats our belly and just hope that everybody will, you know, join hands and sing. Mm -hmm. That's not who Padme mm -hmm. is. I think what's mm -hmm. different, I think that to me where the idea that that comes in is pacifism, somewhat lowered defenses, not a fist should be the starting point. And then the spirit of defense, you react to a specific threat. Padme is going around the galaxy, you know, trying to have negotiations, trying to talk peace. The Phantom Menace is her going to the Senate and saying, can we please find a way to resolve this? Mm -hmm. Okay, then I'll go get my blaster because I'm responding to this specific threat that is real. It is not paranoia. It's not a manipulation. The Trade Federation is enslaving and torturing my people. I will respond to this specific threat. You know, Mothma, Leia, the galaxy raised the rebellion in response to the specific threat of the Empire. And mm. so to me, the way I'm in taking the New Republic era storytelling as it comes is Mothma's big decision, in my opinion, is the correct one. De-escalate, try to work together. Yeah. The question is when specific threats did emerge. Mm-hmm were those threats not responded to well by the New Republic? And that, I think, is the story of Leia and the story of the sequel trilogy era of, like, Leia's all, all, all about, yeah, let's, let's de-escalate, right? Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. I know that in the book she, she wrestles with it and all that, but then there's still that real practical, like, de-escalation is the goal, working together is the goal, but if there's a specific proven threat, we need to be ready to, to respond to it. It, it. I know I'm going on a little bit, but mm -hmm. I think it's, it's a delicate thing. And, and that's the thing for me is like, I, I, I think that we should try to work together. We should not fall into being manipulated by the fear of an alleged ta attack that we don't know is coming mm -hmm. that we mm -hmm. don't know is real. Cause it's such an easy way for leaders to manipulate people of like, get your yeah. guns out. Cause something's coming for you. It's so easy to manipulate people's fear that way i've fallen victim to that uh it, it, times in yeah. my life yeah. so i i think you should be responsive and willing to you know defend when the need for defense is clear and real it, it, it look, look at satine right even even kenobi's got some questions of uh you know it, it, it's banter more than anything but i thought you were a pacifist yeah well no <laughs> yes yes but we're currently being shot at i have to deal mm -hmm. with it. I have to deal with that. Uh, and that's, and it's, and this is so e easily manipulated. And, and Victor's got this great question about it. Victor, you just opened mm -hmm. up more conversation, but like you could easily point at a Padme, Mon Mothma, uh, Satine, any of those kind of characters. Cause look what they did on Mandalore of, of, oh, you're, you, you, you're trying to take away who we are, uh, our culture, our weapons, our religion, all those things that we, we celebrated in, in terms of uh, Mando and great quotes and stuff like that. It's easy to, to, to attach so much to her that she's not saying, talking about Satine, um, about changing our outlook, changing our perspective. It is about change. And, and, and there's that, that, again, even I have it, uh, the position of fear. Again, I was in public safety. You go, uh, every time you step out of your office, you are looking for a threat. And there's some realities to that. There's mm -hmm. there are crimes real, threats are real, uh, the realities of war, realities of, of of dictators in the world, or people who want to abuse. That's all real. But I think it's so easy to say, I can only do that, or I can sit back and and and, and wait. Right? Mm -hmm. It's so easy to just be binary with it. Uh, where I think Mothma is is hey, we we realized our goal, we we won. Um, let's not go forward with this. And, and create this, you know, Star Wars military industrial complex that just grows <laughs> and grows to, to secure people power, people's power. I think of, uh, you know, y y you sleep under the, the blanket of freedom I provide and the question the way I provide it uh, is a great line from a great movie. But it also when you pull back from it, that is just a, a how dare you question my my position and my power and, and mm -hmm. the why, why I'm doing it. It's so easy to do that. So it's so easy to manipulate all this stuff, which is why Mothma to me is even just even more of a fascinating character, particularly after what we've now seen in Andor, exploring a little bit more of her character. Um, so it is, I think I'm jumbling it all up too and just putting it all on the, all on the table. But I love a lot what you're saying of, of 
I guess you could, is the bumper sticker thing, Joseph, don't, don't, don't miss, you know, understand my kindness as weakness. <laughs> that just what uh, it is? I think so. I th- to me, yes, it is. It, it, and it, it's similar with like, I think what Filoni always tells the Lucas story of the interview of here's how a Jedi negotiates. They put the lightsaber on the table, right? Is like, mm-hmm. uh, I think that is also about like, don't mistake. Yes. My kindness for weakness of let's try everything else first. But I also want you to know I'm not a pushover, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And, and th- something that truly needs to be fought will be fought. And, and I feel like that is, we don't know the full story of the new Republic yet. You know? Yes. We only have these bits and pieces. Um, mm-hmm. it, and it, that seems to me like what Mothma is trying to, to, to be of like, we still have a military, the largest in the galaxy. We've named it a defense fleet. So it, it's clear that this is to def- defend from, you know, mm-hmm. it, it, so any, in an external threat, this isn't a, you know, we're not going to send a defense fleet, uh, you know, mm-hmm. to Ryloth because we want more space wheat now, you know? Yeah. yeah. Um, this is about us. It's a defense fleet. It's still the largest in the galaxy. It mm-hmm. still it is the an obstacle that needs to be wiped out before the first order can move. Yeah. Um, probably wasn't enough in that scenario. But you also have the other side of, of Mandalorian that I think maybe some people aren't, um, that it can be easy to overlook. The New Republic is also presented as a, you, you do not bleep with them, right? I mm-hmm, mean, mm-hmm. you could almost look at the the season one episode, The Prisoner, and go, are they over the line on aggression, right? Of 100%. Oh, hey, yeah, looks like they're launching a ship. You know, A, it's like yeah. you, you trigger one alarm on a prisoner ship, the X-Wings are coming. And there's no attitude from any of those characters that like, no, oh, the Mon Mothma's little flower children are going to show up here and give us a lecture about <laughs> kindness, right? It's uh, They're gonna blow the bleep out of us, right? <laughs> and and they don't go in. They don't go in blasters blazing. But it takes very little provocation to like. Well, by then, yeah, yeah. So there's a lot going on with the New Republic, and I think what we're seeing, the storytelling we're seeing, is this push and pull between maybe even an overreaction in that episode. <laughs> no, that, <laughs> you know. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. It wasn't to, to, they're not doing, are they doing enough? Are they doing too yeah. much? And I think that's the story we're seeing right now is, is uh, the, mm-hmm. these flares in both directions. I love that. You know, Trapper Wolf's like, let's go uh, hand ran at, uh, and uh, um, what, what's his name? The brother, a uh, Quinn, uh, uh, a pamphlet. So you want to be at peace now? Like, we're not doing that. <laughs> we, we wiped them out. <laughs> No, nope, like we, yeah. So there's the, and that's, that's the, you know, the new defense, uh, the new Republic defense fleet doing mm-hmm. its job, you know? Yeah. Yeah. No, one of the, my favorite things uh, about this conversation you've said so far is, is, is the Padme of it all, as, as we should all, we should all turn to Padme, one of the key characters in Star Wars. We really do believe that around these parts. And exactly what you're saying, it, it, it's, it's, it, it's when the threat arises, we deal with that threat threat and that's the end goal here and and then you pull back from that right and and Mm -hmm. you find ways to deal with it there you find ways to keep people safe and then i think that mothma clearly influenced by padme um whether it's um directly expressed in 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 content or not she she clearly has been and so i think that's where this this has started we 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 did what we set out to do we can't uh, you know we have to look at it different we have to change um the culture. Otherwise, you do have what you have in Mandalore. You do have Death Watch. You do have people who identify um, with symbols of power and violence as a form of power. And if you don't separate yourself from that, you don't work to separate from yourself, that that could be the dis- destructive uh, you know, poison that seeps in. And I think that's all all tied back to some of that Padme and Satine stuff. Yeah, no, I, absolutely. And I, and I think it's really fascinating. And, you know, this, this will probably uh, continue to come up. But I think we're... We're also just getting a, a big story of a big era from a different perspective. It's a different kind of storytelling. We, we're being given breadcrumbs at the beginning and at the end. And there's so much that we still don't know. Um, whereas, like, say, the the prequel trilogy, um, what happened, it's in the prologue of the novelization of Star Wars, you know? Right, um, and then we see the prequel trilogy, and there is complexity to it, and there is nuance to it. But at the end of the day, Palpatine manipulated the galaxy. He got people to successfully fear another and think strength was the only answer, and he got them to mm-hmm. applaud for handing over their their own freedom. So we can look at that story and go, we know what happened. We know the players. We know who to blame. 
you know, Palpatine. We know we know Padme and Bale are the heroes, and they're looking around at all those other senators and said, he did it. He suckered you. He got you to do believe in something, support something that isn't good for you in the long run. Yeah. We don't have that clarity with the New Republic story. Like, we've got guesses. You know, people mm-hmm. have had some great responses to us on uh, Twitter and on on. YouTube really connecting the dots to the the centrist and the populist uh, in the New Republic. I'm having a lot of fun imagining like that the amnesty program is a compromise. That mm-hmm, mm-hmm. there there oh, are people man. who are saying like we gotta and, and and you know there's stuff in this in the books. That Alex on Star Wars Explained has a great video on the amnesty program. But you know if you imagine it is um, okay. Well, some people in the government are really advocating for we need to give people in the Empire a, a chance to come back to it. And then other people are hardliners and go, yeah, but they're criminals, so they can uh, not fine, fine, fine. You you can do your touchy feely. Let's all heal. BS. But yeah. we're going to do it with numbers, and we're going to do it with keeping them in a box on Coruscant. Mm. And you can see that as a compromise. But everything I just said is headcanon. Mm-hmm. We we we're not getting to see the story. We're not in the room with the New Republic yet. We're not in those Senate debates. We can't we can as viewers look and go, I agree with Mothma. I disagree uh, with, uh, you know, Noah Jabel <laughs> or whoever else is making these bad decisions. Ran, ran some caster foe or whatever. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So it's a really fun, really, really fun time to discuss because we don't have the full story. It's also a dangerous time, I think, because we don't have the full story yet. And it's easy for us to jump to conclusions and it's easy for us to pick out certain characters and blame them when we don't know yet. We haven't, we don't see, we don't have the full story the way we have the full story of the collapse of the uh, Republic. This might spin us off into an entire other discussion, discussion um, with the, the third chapter of Mandalorian of just, I, I, I think you and I both had a little, I don't know, trepidation about how some of the, you could, you could form some opinions and theories on what it was saying about the New Republic at that point in the timeline, all of them which were very valid, lessons about learning. Did they learn? Uh, why do they get the mind flared? Are they the Empire? You know, but the story's not done yet. And if you're not careful with how you're explaining it or you're not careful with how you're explaining your feelings about it, I think you could really uh, slag off the New Republic as all the same, slag off Mon Mothma as, as being a part of the problem more than the solution. And we're just not, I love your idea, we're just not done yet. Let's get to it all. There's some stuff, th- some themes there that with, are without a doubt there, especially in that third chapter. Mm-hmm. Uh, I've just seen a lot of discussion around that too, but oh, uh, dumb new Republic. Time out, time out. Yeah, and maybe it is a failure, but we we haven't been given the evidence yet of who is making the choices, who do we agree with, and who do we disagree with. And and I think it's common, right? Because I think there's so much going on, even with that more recent quote with Filoni. We are recording this before we saw the most recent episode of Mandalorian, so who knows? Um, maybe that'll just be an, an hour of Grogu eating soup, uh, <laughs> learning to enjoy different Mandalorian soups. We don't know, but I'm excited to talk about it. We got more of this coming up. We'll have more of this coming up, but I also want to talk about it carefully because we don't know the full story yet. Love that. All right. Uh, that's just our first question. We'll knock out these other ones real quick. Uh, yeah, I'm joking. Mm-hmm. Uh, next question comes to us from Twitter as well. Darth Pundit, <laughs> which that's is a great name. That's great. Uh, Darth's question is uh, sort of thematically connected. He says, shields. I'm a sucker for energy shields in Star Wars from the squad shields in Battlefront 2 to the henchman shield wall in Book of Boba Fett to the Mandalorian gauntlet shields in Clone Wars. And recently, the Mandalorian Season 3 Bo-Katan's shield lightsaber combo was amazing. Here's the question. Would it be weird for a Jedi to use a shield along with a lightsaber? Makes sense conceptually, always for defense but more of a European knight than samurai aesthetic. And for some reason, it feels a little off. What's more important, function or vibes? Yeah. <laughs> uh, I love this question. Ken, where do you go with function or vibes and, like and shields for the Jedi? I feel like we're shopping for a new car. Do you want something <laughs> functional or just want a vibe, man? This is a great question. Ah, oh, man, I love the Force Center listeners, our Force Center friends. They just go to such wonderful places. My my initial reaction is, yeah, God, it would be off. I've never really thought about that. But that, mm-hmm. that bleep ain't right. Like, that wouldn't look right. Because I love, I love the, you know, Bo-Katan's had that stuff in animation. In live action, it looks so good. And that, it just works for the Mando vibe and the function, right? The Mandalorians uh, are, are high tech, even though we've learned there's a lot of spirituality and, and culture or the armor of it all uh to that weaponry 
Um, I it just it just fits. And on the other side, you got the Jedi. It, it just it, it, it thematically, you're absolutely right, Darth Mundt. It, it totally works. It just it it wouldn't work for me just straight away. I think you'd have to find ways to do it, but we can get into that in a second. I propose group shields for Jedi, where maybe it's just a shield bubble for all, not just for me. I'm sharing the shields. <laughs> no, I like that. I like that a lot. Um, I, I think for me to just directly answer Darth Pundit's uh, question about function or vibes, for me at the end of the day in Star Wars, it's vibes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, it's vibes and meaning, right? This is one of those questions where like, if you really look at it and be like, okay, well, if it's it, like Darth Pundit's saying, it's like, if it's defense, like, yeah, you got your, your lightsaber, mm -hmm. but yeah, get a shield too. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, this is one of those TIE fighters make noise in space. That's where I start. Like right, in right, the right. cold vacuum of space, they wouldn't scream. But you know what? It's vibes. It's cool that yeah. they scream. It is meaningful. That it, it, it is the hell scream of a predator coming for you. Um, yeah. it, and I think with the sort of the logic of the Jedi just having lightsabers, it's about vibes and meaning. You know, mm. I think... Um, I have been coveting a uh, Macquarie Stormtrooper concept action figure. Uh, I looked at one, and now eBay is sending me these seven tempting emails a day going, are you sure you don't want this? Um, <laughs> the great Macquarie concept, Stormtroopers with the with the shield and the lightsabers. And, you know, clearly there was a, there was a design moment where Star, Star Wars was at least, uh, possibly, let's treat this more like European knights. Mm -hmm, uh, mm hmm and I'm sure knights from other places as well. They're all, everybody's got a sword and a shield. It's just, these are, yeah. these are laser swords. And then at some point it shifts to like, no, the lightsaber is more special than that. Mm -hmm. It's more meaningful. And I think it, it's vibes and it's meaning. And, and Darth Pundit is, I think, acknowledging this in, in the question really well, mm -hmm. that the shield would diminish the lightsaber. Uh, right. For the Jedi, it is the one weapon, often the one single possession of the Jedi. It's not just a weapon. It's a symbol. It's a symbol of hope. But also for the Jedi, I think it's a, a, a symbol of commitment in skill. If you're yeah. going to pick, anybody could pick, Han picked it up and... <laughs> and uh, and, and, yeah. that's right and made a made a fun bed for luke real quick yeah uh yeah. some some kids get race car beds <laughs> luke gets a daunt on bed <laughs> right lots of people maybe not the dark saber but maybe other sabers people can pick up and slack and hash right or yeah. other way around <laughs> hack and slash um but for a jedi it's with skill commitment training this weapon is a shield. It's mm -hmm. every bit as good as yeah. a shield. A, a, a shield is a shortcut to what pouring our devotion into this blade can and should be. And to me, that's it's vibes and meaning. No, great, great as always. And I like that the final big point there of uh, <laughs> not that I want Jedi to shame and bully people. But like, oh, you got a shield? What are you, not good with your saber? Like, what are you doing over there? What are you doing over there? Because um, essentially, uh, if you're connected to what's going on, right? Connected to the blade, connected to the moment, feeling everything around you. Yeah, it is It is your shield. So I love that view as well. But I'm still pitching. All right, what if it has a shield on the handle? <laughs> yeah, no, yeah. I like that. I like that. Yeah. So yeah. I... You go, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, 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 no. Yeah, I don't want to undercut any of, of, of the, the beautiful things he said there. I uh, uh, just think it'd be kind of kind of funny. You know, Ezra made his own little blaster one there. Because I remember there was quite a reaction even Ezra with that one. Like, oh, what, you need a little blaster from your lightsaber? But I actually like that lightsaber. I got, got to confess. Uh, I, I like that one, too. I like it a lot. And then, you know, when the Inquisitors use their blade as the, like the big spinning shield, right? Uh, they mm -hmm. spin it enough that it's blocking everything. Yeah. Um, so I love I love that as the core idea of like yeah the, the, we don't need a shield the blade is the shield, um, but that said I this shield stuff is interesting and cool and I love the the Mandalorian you know history that their shields that we uh, I think we saw Paz Vizsla use one as well but you know with Bo-Katan mm -hmm. we really got to see it in action live action in combo with the dark saber which was really cool and did evoke mm -hmm. these classic knight like images 
Um, but I love that those shields exist, uh, at least in some Mandalorians, uh, history in opinion as a counterbalance to lightsabers, you know, totally. Um, so, so they do have a connection to lightsabers, uh, is awesome. And even with everything I've said with the Jedi, I'd be fascinated to see eras of Jedi or specific Jedi who buck the system. And it's like, Hey, take me on with the lightsaber. I'm the, I'm the, I'm the best you're going to find. I still find a shield handy. <laughs> and I'm not going to yeah. stand on ceremony here, you know? I, I, I think our minds went to similar spots. So I, I would like to see a time period. Uh, you know, High Republic's this kind of big general term right now, but I think maybe even before that where, uh, you know, maybe the lightsabers aren't as developed yet, right? Maybe the, the Kyber's there, but maybe the tech is a little different. Those power packs we've seen in the, the Legend stuff, right? Uh, which was like me to run in a VCR in my video production class in high school. I had a camera <laughs> and a VCR literally hanging on my uh, back there. Uh, but maybe a t time where these... Uh, you know, looking at the the classic, uh, you know, I know it's a uh, you know, European night, and, and you're right. There's there's knights of all kinds everywhere. But w what Darth Pondit's kind of invoking here, that image of uh, I love I love of Jedi is like hedge knights roaming the land, looking for a place to put their heads, a, a tree to sleep under, but also helping those in need in these little villages, these planets, these systems. And maybe it would just fit the aesthetic more then. And I, I could get behind that. Maybe they even have a little armor for their heads you know so, so you some some shields uh, a cape mm -hmm. a, definitely a glorious cape ride a space horse maybe i do just want medieval star wars <laughs> yeah no i mean i think in some ways these sort of images of the clone wars of them getting the uh the clone armor you know which is mm -hmm. powerful to us to see you know obi-wan dressed like what would later become a stormtrooper you know is is powerful mm -hmm. in the star wars context but it is also powerful at evoking of like yeah look it's look what it's like when they are truly knights going out and yeah. fighting yeah yeah oh, that's cool and maybe during the clone wars you know if they're gonna have the armor maybe hey pick pick up a shield and protect your clones <laughs> <laughs> uh any other thoughts on this one before we take a break Nah, I loved it. Great stuff, Darth Vaughn. And at the end, of the day, I got the 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 live action version of Bo Katan's Shields was one of my favorite little details of that third chapter. Yeah, and, and speaking of hacking and slashing, <laughs> mm -hmm. to prove that I can say it correctly, I love everything they've been doing with the uh, with Din, like that absolute butchery in the butcher shop in Book of yeah. Boba Fett, and then getting to see Bo Katan wield it so uh, much more uh, fluidly was awesome. Indeed, indeed. And looking forward to more. Maybe we've already seen more by now, but uh, we are going to take a quick break and we will be back with our questions from our patrons on Patreon. Back in a moment. And we are back to answer more cues. We're going to our patrons from Patreon. This one comes to us from David Hemker. David says, Greetings, Force Center. Like many of the questions submitted to you, I too would like to start by saying how much I appreciate your thoughtful, open-minded, and overall positive approach to all things Star Wars. The podcast has been a regular on my daily commute for the past couple years, and I have you and the Force to thank for my decrease in road rage incidents. Uh, <laughs> pause there for a moment to say thank you very much uh, for the compliment. Uh, appreciate it. Uh, They're not necessary <laughs> for questions. Mm -hmm. um, but thank you for the kind words, and thank you, for uh, uh, David, for sharing how and when you listen that it's a commute and that it uh, helps with road rage because that does relate to the rest of david's questions uh any thoughts on that before i read the rest of david's questions i, I think i need to listen to four center while i'm driving to avoid <laughs> the road rage i sometimes have in la my road rage is is in check it's when it explodes it explodes and that's what i get so i need to just put on some data make dive when that happens no, I, I, I understand. I'll we'll share some, some road rage uh, thoughts here in a moment. Here's the rest of uh, David's question. David says, my question is a bit of my own headcanon, but I was curious about your thoughts in A New Hope. When Vader strikes down Obi-Wan on the Death Star, Luke screams no before firing at the stormtroopers across the hangar. His shots here appear to be way more accurate than just before. Here he has hmm. three troopers within seconds versus two total <laughs> en route to Falcon to the Falcon with Leia. Uh, he also hits the door controls on his first attempt when Han shouts, blast the door, kid. Do you think that Luke was unknowingly tapping into the dark side of the Force in that moment? And maybe that helped with his aim. If so, and if Obi-Wan's voice telling him to run hadn't snapped him out of it, what do you think the result could have been? Thanks, and may the force be with you. May the force be with you, David, on the road and at all times. Uh, yeah, so let's let's get into this. Um, yeah, the, uh, just I think this relates to the dark side. <laughs> yep, yep, yeah. uh, the I did relate to the road rage thing because because I have gotten you know mm -hmm. angry on the road and in it 
times when I can be calm and just let other people go in front and all that stuff. It's so great. Mm -hmm. I picked my wife up uh, at uh, LAX last night and I was feeling in a calm, peaceful mood at a nice drive uh, and listening to uh, to K Jazz <laughs> yeah. radio station. And it's just funny to see the amount of um, totally, uh, frankly, pointless road rage in LAX. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. You, if you get angry, all you're going to do is bend your own fender. Yeah. This is frustrating yeah. for all of us, and there's nothing that any of us can do about it. So yeah. let's just all take our take our time. Oh, yeah. um, and I've had times that I've been mad in the car, and I've thought about Four Center and been like, I should I should listen to what we talk about and take a deep breath. So mm -hmm. very relatable, David. Mm -hmm. How do you feel, Ken, about uh, this idea that Luke is possibly tapping into the dark side? I really like it. I have a I have a sort of a counter pitch to it I'll go into, but I actually really like it. And in terms of the direct question of, you know, if he hadn't run, Obi-Wan doesn't snap him out of it. What do you think? What do you think the result? I, I quite frankly could have been dead, but I think more than anything captured. Right. And, and that's mm -hmm. probably what Vader would have wanted. And we got a whole new different set of circumstances. And now Leia needs to hopefully go back and rescue him. Maybe that, that would have, that would have been Empire Strikes Back. Now, um, so, but I like the dark side thing. Um, there's a lot of set, all those kind of dark side things, right. Pop up. You got a lot of fear, doubt, anger, confusion, rage, all of it. Uh, and that, as Yoda always preaches, is is maybe the quicker path, a little more seductive. And look at that. You're hitting you're hitting targets from miles away now. Don't you want to keep that <laughs> going? I can get behind that vibe. And I, and I think uh, I'm thankful, regardless of where we land on uh, the themes and everything behind it. I'm glad Obi-Wan was there to snap him out of it. No, I agree. I think I think it's it's vital that Luke leaves, uh, you know, hey, to get the plans mm -hmm. <laughs> to the mm -hmm. rebellion. But yeah, I think he's he's captured. He's killed. Uh, Vader, you know, uh, maybe make some connection to who he is. Uh, it's extremely important that Luke goes at that moment, you know? Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. So I think uh, the result could have been bad for absolutely everybody if uh, luke didn't turn i think it's part of obi-wan's sacrifices vader is distracted by w what is happening what is going on i i mm -hmm. have to half have have this victory i've always wanted in him uh, also how did he even in death <laughs> stify me again right. um mm -hmm. but i really agree with what you're talking about with um with kind of the the idea of what the the analogy of anger in the dark side is in in star wars um mm -hmm. i really like this headcanon that he's tapping into the force and maybe a little bit uh, of the dark mm -hmm. side um i guess you could make the argument that for the most part the other stormtroopers are shooting at him and he's just <laughs> opening up on some stormtroopers mm -hmm. who are hanging out watching a cool fight <laughs> yeah, yeah. Hey, hey, hey what's going on the wizards but fight. He, the wizards are fighting the wizards are fighting uh, yeah mm -hmm. um but I, I think there's an utter precision. Hamill certainly plays it with anger, right? And pain. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and this all tracks to me with, with uh, the analogy of Star Wars, uh, Yoda's lessons that you're talking about of quicker, easier, more seductive, mm -hmm. and what I've experienced in my own life. I think that, you know, Palpatine says uh, anger gives you focus. Mm -hmm. And I think he's right. And that's, I think, where the illusion of power comes from, right? Yeah. When there, I've had times in my life where I get angry and it feels good because the anger pushes me past every other emotion. It mm -hmm. pushes me past fear, anxiety, caution. It makes me focus on just the thing I want right now. And it makes me feel powerful and effective. Mm -hmm. And... I think Luke is, he's not w worrying about, am I going to be hit by those stormtroopers? <laughs> right, right. He's, you know, he, he's, he's past fear. He's past anxiety. He's caution. All he's thinking about is they got to go down right now. Mm -hmm. They have to pay for this, you know? And, you know, same thing with the door. The door has to close, right? Um, so I think it's this great analogy that, yes, anger can give you focus, but it's a fleeting power um, yeah. unless you turn that, that focus into something more productive. And I think kind of the, the whole lesson of the light side and the strength of the light side is, yeah, you can achieve that level of focus r real quick through anger and lashing out. Um, mm. But if you master your fear and your anxiety and, and maybe being overcautious, 
by looking at them fully, acknowledging them and trying to find a way past them, you can get to that same level of focus uh, instead of just burying them with your anger and, mm -hmm. and acting on that. And all those ideas that are in Star Wars, I, I've never really put them to this scene, but I think they're really there. You know, it, it's, mm -hmm. it's kind of a, a fun lore question of did he tap into the forest? Did he tap into the dark side? But even, even if he didn't, the mm -hmm. sort of moral lesson of what's, what's happening there is really interesting to think about. Yeah. And even we've talked about it here too. Of like, it's so easy to, you know, tap, like you said, tap into the, 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 the dark side or tap into the force, even Bo-Katan with Grogu, like you're good at force. Like she has that like kind of quote, of, <laughs> you, you, you good at forcing. Um, it is, it, but, but the force is really, uh, it, it's about the day-to-day -day choices of those day-to-day -day moments and the light and dark, and dark, exi dark existing everywhere, um, whether you're a space wizard or not. So I think, I can go with you on that. The big powerful thing. And, and it's a beautiful, wonderful, wonderful breakdown on what actually is there. What actually is happening. I, like I said, I have a counter when we're ready for it, but it's in the same ballpark. It's just a different point of view. I want to hear the counter. Okay. Here's my counter. Oh, I'm so excited. Uh, again, I also want to submit, I, I think a lot of what we talked so far, so far, I think is, this isn't about a right or wrong answer, but I, I just think that it just works for Star Wars in so many ways. But, it, but the, there's a lot of things that's very similar. It's just a twitch on it there. If in that moment, in that moment, Ben's died. Um, what if all those things around him that we'd seen prior to this on the Death Star are removed? Fear, doubt, anger, all the stuff that uh, he's running around. He's, he's out of his element. He's he's doing some great things. He's rescuing a princess, getting trapped in a trash compactor. He doesn't quite know. And he has that doubt. You just go through that life every day. You get on a stage, right? Uh, do I, uh, are my jokes written? Do I know my, what am I doing? Is the crowd going to like me? What am I doing? And you can make some mistakes. And so what, it just in that moment, he instincts um, take over. It's mm. all clear. He's focused because of what he's just seen happen there. And he wasn't blocked in that moment. He wasn't in his head. You almost say he's in his own sports wise. And, 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 all that was removed. All those things that trip us up. All those things that might lead to anger and doubt and just uh, some sort of uh, failure in terms of uh, the mission's not a success. All those kind of things that you're running around the Death Star going, uh, 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 in that moment, you're like, oh, this is what it's all about. And and that's why I can suddenly suddenly hit things from, from a mile away or whatever the distance was. But still, it all leads into Obi-Wan's voice for me. Um, it is a snapping out of a moment, but it's definitely a, I'm gone You've got to go. You've got to let go. You, mm -hmm. You're still on the dark side. All that stuff, all that sport zone thing you're experiencing and you're killing stormtroopers and you're shutting doors down and great, you blocked Vader. But if, if you don't let go of me, you, all this is is for naught. And, mm. and putting your life, your journey forward. And so it's still kind of the same spot. I still think it's dark side stuff in terms of the lessons. Uh, you know. But sometimes I experience that where if you just have too much too much time to think about it or too much uh, not uh, over preparation is not a bad thing, but just for me, I, 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 I need to sometimes just f feel the flow, go to my instincts and all those silly little things in my brain, um, which are of the dark side. I can't do this. I don't belong here. Oh, this isn't good. Oh, I'm so mad. All those things can f sometimes fade away when I am uh, jolted out of it. And, um, but all of all for not, if you don't move forward, change and grow and, and let go. Yeah, no, I, I, I really love uh, what you're saying. And I, I think it is meaningful to what you're saying and, and to the question that this sequence ends with uh, Luke being convinced to let it go, being convinced to redirect uh, mm -hmm. this energy from shooting those stormtroopers isn't going to bring Obi-Wan back and it isn't going to help them particularly escape. Yeah. And he is let go of, of that anger that focus and redirected towards actually doing something productive, <laughs> which yeah. is shooting, shooting the door. Yeah. And I really agree with you. I think we're saying, uh, similar things of mm -hmm, mm -hmm. getting, getting caught up in, in all of those things that, that hold you back. I also just, uh, I I'm taking with this cause I think there's just such a difference in, uh, Mark Hamill's performance of yeah. Yeah. he's making these great shots on the stormtroopers, and it's, anger you know it's it's yeah. you you took something from me uh and then he's convinced to let go let go of all those anxieties but mm -hmm. then you compare that to taking out the death star right like mm -hmm. that the look on his face is concentration precision it's not this is for bigs a-holes you know um 
maybe one percent, maybe one percent, yeah, 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 maybe one percent, right? right? Yeah. But it, it is, you know, it it is more purely about getting past all of the things that hold you back, right? Get get past the idea that you're a farm boy who can't do this, and everybody tells you that the targeting computer is the way to do it, and if you try to do it without a targeting computer, you'll fail. Put all that away. Listen to your gut. Trust yourself. Um, it, it is is the lesson. Yeah, all that kind of found there in that moment. Love it. Love it. Yeah, great stuff. Very fun discussion. Uh, I can't wait to rewatch that scene and give it even more thought. We're going to move on to our final question from James Pasqualucci. Uh, James says, hello there, Force Center. Before I ask my question, I wanted to again give my <laughs> the yeah. deepest gratitude for welcoming me and everyone in this community to your wonderful show, for your wonderful answers, and your thought-provoking insight that continues to inspire me. Uh, thank you very much. The kind words are very much appreciated. Uh, these were the next two questions up in a row. I did not pick two questions that started uh, with compliments. And uh, very, very much uh, appreciate them, but also not, uh, <laughs> not a prerequisite of answer, asking a question. Uh, here is James' question. Uh, my question for today is about Coruscant and the evolution of its loyalty to the rights of the galaxy. We know that Coruscant has always been a planet of privilege, being the heart of the Republic for years. And for years after the Empire was established, the residents were largely happy to continue under this new regime. By the time of Return of the Jedi, we see them in open celebration of the Empire's fall, complete with crashing statues of old Sheev, tossed stormtroopers, and fireworks. Around the time of the book Bloodline, I believe Coruscant supported a more centralized government with the centrists, and that there may have been First Order sympathizers there too. But after the Battle of Exegol, thanks to the junior novelization of Rise of Skywalker, we know that they were in open revolt against the First Order. All this is to ask, what made the residents of Coruscant realize the evil of the Empire First Order and take a stand? What made them listen to Mon Mothma's words and realize the error of their definition of wrong? Thanks again for all you do, and may the Force be with you. May the Force be with you, James. That is a fascinating question. Uh, I want to throw in a little bit of context from Wikipedia on this one as well. Mm. Um, so during the New Republic era, uh, Coruscant was not the capital. Uh, that, that gets you know moved around uh, to Chandrilla, to Hazian Prime. Um, and I, We don't have a ton of storytelling about that. Uh, but according to uh, Wikipedia... And the character Hondo, here's what's going on in Coruscant <laughs> during the New Republic. So you can decide how much you want to trust Wikipedia and Hondo, listeners. Uh, but here is the paragraph. Despite being a part of the New Republic, the planet actually fell under the control of criminal syndicates after the Empire's fall. By the time following the Battle of Crate in 34 ABY, even the respectable areas of Coruscant were roamed by gangs. Gangs fought a bloody conflict for control of the glittering world's districts. Districts, Tourism to the once galactic capital all but vanished, and for an individual to be safe, they needed to afford protection like droids and armed guards. Accordingly, the city world was not a symbol of galactic possibilities. Instead, it represented the disturbing realities of the galactic's current time period. The pirate Hondo Onaka, who was saddened by Coruscant's current state, included the planet in his book titled Galactic Explorer's Guide. Within the book, RA7 protocol droid DKRA43 described Coruscant's fall from grace into lawlessness as one of the greatest tragedies of their current era. In 35 ABY, Coruscant was in an open rebellion against the First Order. So, uh, mm -hmm. I think all of that is from this one book, Galactic Explorer's guide so mm. as always you know wikipedia does a great job of of capturing everything this is storytelling that's in place from this one book maybe it'll get shifted but for now that's a little bit of the picture of what happens of course not after the empire and into the new republic it is not the center of things anymore and it falls into uh some control of uh of disreputable people uh did you ha have you read the galactic explorers guide is this news to you <laughs> <laughs> Do you uh, trust Hondo? <laughs> I trust Hondo, Uncle Hondo. I trust him. Uh, that is, for the most part, news to me. Like, yeah, I think almost 99% news to me. May have heard some scraps somewhere. But, um, yeah, that makes me even think different about maybe my answer. So I like that. That's great context. Oh, awesome. Yeah. So, I mean, it, it is definitely, you know, uh, some more rich storytelling. And we've been getting a lot of Coruscant with Andor and with Mandalorian. So mm -hmm. hoping for more. Mm -hmm. Um so where do you start with this, Ken? I, I started the overall vibe up top here with, with James uh, talking about uh, 
you know, just it is it is a planet of, of privilege and, and and there's nothing you can do about that other than choose to look beyond that. Right. We've talked a, a lot about that of of, um, you know, Empire, New Republic. They're all I can't t- keep track. They're all the same. Some of the quotes we've heard in various ways in Andor and in and now Mandalorian. Um, you have to choose to push past that. You have to choose to connect. You have to choose to see who might be affected by change in regimes or change in policies or just policies in general. I think that's a big lesson that is at the, at the core of this uh, complacency will set in. I think, um, I think it had set in, not just this Hondo information uh, aside. Um, I, and I look going to the end of this year of, of why um, you could just say, well, some airs of the way. I think the simple, simple way is Lando showed up and said, Hey, be better. Um, I think that, but I think there's, it's, it's, it's especially at the battle of Mexico time period, there's a lot of maybe the next generation did not want to keep repeating what had happened before, including, Hey, this fell into the wrong hands because of reasons X, Y, and Z. And we want to make a difference when we part of this. And now's the time. Uh, so much of the secret trilogy being, uh, how you deal with what's hanging over you and what came before you and what's your place in that and what's your place going forward. And, and it th- seems like it was kind of a not a good spot. Bum deal, right? Bum deal going on in Corson. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and we are choosing to be part of the solution. Uh, and maybe it just took a couple generations. Because 30, what, are we looking at 30 years? 30, 30, mm-hmm. 30 35-ish years, 35-ish. years, yeah. I mean, just think of it. Think of it now. That means you got people running for office uh, who probably might not have even been alive when the Battle of Yavin and Endor and all that stuff happened. So, hey. We're going to make a change to be better, and now's the time. We just needed good people to lead us to give us the confidence. Mm. Yeah, no, I, I like I, I like that idea that uh, that in the era of Rise of Skywalker, that that mm-hmm. Coruscant might have uh, benefited from some of the inspiration, uh, the uh, the yeah. resistance being the spark that lit the fire. Um, that it, it's great to think that some of those acts might might have truly made a difference and, and reached Coruscant and re- reached people on Coruscant and the idea that you you can make a difference you you can stand up you know yeah yeah the absolutely. lessons of uh, Luke and Rose and reaching Coruscant is a really beautiful idea I like that a lot mm-hmm. um, I think for me kind of going going to the the beginning of this timeline of of the what do the people of Coruscant uh, believe in are they clear about their beliefs are they just responding to what they see what I start with is just the idea that, that Coruscant really does contain multitudes. Um, Mm -hmm. Coruscant, you know, in visually, at least partially even inspired, you know, by the film films like Metropolis. Uh, but we actually get to see it in action in, in storytelling is that there's a rigid class structure and it's, Mm -hmm. it's literal, right? There, there are the people in the penthouses, the people Mm -hmm. in the middle, and the people way down in the lower levels. So yeah. one of the things I start with is, well, every time we see the reactions of the people of Coruscant, either we explicitly know who on Coruscant we're talking about, or sometimes, like in the shots at the end of Return of the Jedi, we don't know. You know, there is, we don't zoom in and see that, ah, those are aristocrats. <laughs> <laughs> now willing to ruffle their robes by tossing that stormtrooper about, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so sort of, uh, this comes partially from storytelling mm-hmm. that, you know, can point to evidence and partially fully acknowledging headcanon. But I think what we've, we've seen in the story is that during the Empire's reign, uh, the the rich and the powerful on, on Coruscant, the penthouse people, um, mm-hmm. not all of them, but some that we have seen, uh, didn't perceive any change to their lives. The Empire was truly no different than the Republic. And right. then the new Republic isn't that different than the empire because their lives mm-hmm. didn't really change. And if they did, uh, they successfully blamed it on, you know, uh, rebels and dissidents and rabble rousers mm-hmm. causing pro- rabble problems rabble. out in the galaxy. Right. Yeah. Um, this is explicitly going on with Perrin. It's explicitly going on at Mon Mothma's dinner party. We, we mm-hmm. get that perspective the, from the aristocrat talking to Pershing. Right. Yeah. So I think for the era of the empire, for the powerful people on Coruscant is just like, well, business as usual, what, what's the problem? So that leads me to think like that scene in at the end of Return of the Jedi is like, hey, that's not that's not Perrin. <laughs> Perrin's not putting right, his back right. into, into, into push and sheave. Uh, that that aristocrat who, who talked to Pershing uh, was locked in his penthouse as mm-hmm. the 
people from the mid to lower levels who felt decades of inequality, Mm -hmm. restriction on their movements. Uh, Perrin could probably go wherever he wanted and gamble whatever he wanted, and maybe stormtroopers were going to break his kneecaps, Uh, Mm -hmm. but the the people on the lower levels, stormtroopers could come down there and do whatever they wanted, right? Yeah. Uh, And there would be no justice. I think it's the people who lived in the middle and the lower levels who are pushing over Sheev and tossing that stormtrooper around at the end of Return of the Jedi. I mean, especially if you, you know, spend some time hanging out there with Trace and Rafa and that, that era, that stuff. I love what you're <laughs> you know, right. It, it's, it's 13, 13 coming up to toss over some statues. Yeah. I would love it if you, if you could super zero in on the special edition and the people <laughs> tossing the stormtrooper around are Trace and Rafa. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. yeah, and I love that. I love that take on it. Yeah, it's a snapshot. It's it's a, it's a small moment in Star Wars history, but we haven't spent a lot of time in the details of it. And people maybe, are getting really. Go, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, maybe we will in future storytelling. Yeah, no, I I would love if we continue this storytelling to to see a scene of like that the aristocrat, you know, from mm-hmm. uh, talking to Pershing, watching in horror from his penthouse as the the people yes. push that statue, and you're like, oh, geez. <laughs> Yeah, no, yeah, yeah, absolutely, yeah, yeah, and, and they can't, can't come down. Masamita up there, you know, he's he Masamita yeah. is probably up there in the tower, looking like Saruman at the uh, end of Two Towers, where he's just watching the ants destroy everything, and he's like, oh, I can't, I'm not going down there. <laughs> nope. nope, nope. Masamita is locking the doors, and you know, talking about class things in in big ways. Obviously, I, I'm sure that the Empire managed to swindle uh, some people of lower income to. To believe that everything was great uh, on Coruscant, and as we see from characters like Mon Mothma and Vel, uh, that mm-hmm. people who have a lot of money and power can also resist it. So, um, mm-hmm. paint, painting with a broad brush on these fictional characters, but uh, that—that's the story I'm I'm seeing. Um, th- I think it's really, really fascinating then to to look at the difference between the Empire and the First Order, right? Mm-hmm. We, as the audience, can kind of look outside and say, "Oh, it's it's the." Uh, same philosophy, it's the same dogma. The First Order is explicitly trying to say to the galaxy, the New Republic is weak and broken and your lives are worse. We're the Empire, but better. Mm. We are the Empire 2.0, uh, stronger, more control, better. Mm. Um, so you can look at it as the people on Coruscant going, ah, I'm, I'm looking at these philosophies and comparing them. But to me, what I think about viscerally when I think about living on Coruscant uh, even if your life wasn't great, say you're kind of a midway down in the, in the skyscrapers mm-hmm. during the era of the empire, and you didn't totally like it, but your planet was the capital of the government. Uh, you maybe didn't like the emperor, but he was your emperor, right? Mm. Uh, if the, the, the new Republic government has left Coruscant, uh, it's in not great shape. They're, they're, you know, crime lords, all that. Mm. Snoke and Kylo and the whole First Order, they see themselves as a continuation of the Empire. But to that person who lived through the Empire, who's still alive on Coruscant, I think they're invaders, right? I don't mm. think it's take the pamphlet and go, ah, their dogma's, dogma's the same, and I used to kind of support the Empire. I'll support right, the First right. Order. They're invaders. They're from the unknown regions. And mm. they're they're wearing the insignias. They're flying ships that look like the old ones. But they're coming from the outside not to save you from crime lords, but to also put you under their boot. It's just much easier to see the First Order as invaders to be resisted than even if you didn't like the Empire, you were the Empire. Yeah, I, I like that. Oh, I like that idea. Um, there are there are imposters in a way, but dangerous in their own. I mean, Empire, Empire, pretty dangerous, I'll say. Mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah, the First Order has this extra edge to them that they're out for this kind of um, vengeance. They've been personally wronged by you, you. You took our power. You took our emperor. Blah blah. It's a different vibe, right? It's mm-hmm. uh, the, the policies are far reaching and destructive on a level uh, not currently offered in this time period by the, the other crime lords. But yeah, I, I I I like what you're saying that that you, you're sitting up there going, well, no, that's still still not good. Not what I had. Yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. it, it, it's just easier to separate it from mm-hmm. yourself, right? Yeah. Um, it, it, and we still haven't seen some of this storytelling, too. Like, the way in The Force Awakens, Han and Leia are very aware of Snoke, the First Order, as a political faction is right. known. It's just assumed that, like, okay, they're, you know, okay, I guess, the, I guess they 
you know, took over a couple of these planets here in the outer rim, but they're not really going to invade the galaxy. They're not going to invade Coruscant. Like, right. we, we still haven't seen that story. And we haven't seen really, like, when the First Order revealed themselves to the galaxy at large, came out of the unknown regions, you know? Was Snoke yeah. the, did Snoke go on, you know, Holonet talk shows and make a pitch mm -hmm. <laughs> for mm -hmm. people to invest in? in the philosophy of the first order or is it truly from people's perspective in invasion from the unknown regions from the outside it's a great question because i almost want a little little column a little column b like did snoke run for chancellor like I'm the third party <laughs> candidate you need i'm a disruptor I'll drink this one. come on in here um and then that didn't work and then or, you know i don't know maybe i don't know maybe something paved the way for the, what you're talking about it is fascinating it's some it's part of the the little details that Force Awakens lays out there that I think over the years, sometimes I wish I had a little bit more of a, a lay of the land, the, the state of the galaxy kind of vibe of Force Awakens. It didn't need to do that. It wasn't setting out to do that. Um, you can apply all the reasons why you think that was the case. But I, I the, the, the Snoke thing, knowing Snoke, um, I love that. I'm intrigued by that. Yeah. And, and, and is it because Luke encountered him and, and they right. know him? Or does the galaxy, does, does the whole galaxy know? Yeah. <laughs> Third party candidate Snoke. <laughs> <laughs> promising everybody you know uh peace in our time and gold robes for all yeah yeah because i think at the time i took it as luke right as luke knew snoke there was something there was something kind of smaller in terms of snoke but you definitely get the idea that's what's going on the first order is this very public threat people are aware of that they either didn't take serious or um you know look what's going look look the, the, the colossus star wars resistance right you're mm -hmm. very aware who they are They've been there. They've been there. Uh, and that's right. You're, you're right. Yeah, yeah. They're, yeah. And they're doing exactly what, you know, what mm -hmm. we're talking about of like, they're not, they're, they're just in their little sector, sector of space. Yeah, they're taking things. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And this brings us all the way back to <laughs> the first question. I think the real criticism of the New Republic, you know, mm -hmm. maybe, you know, Mothma could have set it up better, but Mothma's not there anymore. Leia's trying. And that's the failure as, as the first order is moving in on places like the Colossus, mm -hmm. people are not responding to the threat because they don't want to go back to this, right? They don't want to believe it. And that I'm that I really want Star Wars to dive in because that's such a real world thing. Abrams has talked about it in interviews of that idea of, uh, in, in okay, yep, in in the past, people who have used the word this the label Nazi have done X. Now these people are calling themselves Nazis, but they're not really Nazis, right? Or they're saying the exact same thing as the Nazis did, but they're not really going to do that, right? And like, yeah. go, even going to historical, you know, you know, uh, actual uh, uh, newspaper mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. discussion of Hitler's just really, he's just really using the anger. You know, he's saying some really shocking things, but he's just using that as a savvy political move. He doesn't actually mean that, you know? Right. And, yeah. and I think that's the storytelling area that that the first order is playing around in of, of people not wanting to believe that they really mean they're, they're not just kind of cosplaying the empire they really mean it and they're really going to do it and not taking that seriously soon enough yes yeah, they're not just a black and white photo from from history's past that they're here they're real and um yeah i think that's uh love that's that that definitely is part of the first order particularly force awakens but yeah 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 it, it's it, star wars resistance be, it, it, i think is one of those things that just it's easy to overlook the show. A lot of people maybe did. That's maybe just the harsh reality of that show, but it's a great show. Um, it definitely has some vibes, definitely the things that are that are skewed younger. We've discussed that time and time again, but there's just some valuable storytelling for that time period in the lay of the land. Uh, going You're in. very right. I'm really glad you brought that up because it is, we see some of the things we're talking about. The see, we see the people like, yeah, that's in the past. You know, uh, we get to see older people um, like Jaeger and, and Doza who, who've been through this and don't want it to be oh, happening. Yeah. Yet, right. And totally understandably. Right. Just don't, they just don't, this it's, it's not happening again. It can't be. Yeah. Doza and, and, and Jarek Yeager are two of my favorite characters in Star Wars when I stop to think about it, right? I think that they don't pop into my head as much as I want them to. But mm -hmm. they just, they're such a, Yeager, just this like, yeah, war veteran with scars and losses and, and trauma and that ain't fun. So, of course, I'm going to have a, a thought before I step forward into that. And, and yeah. learn from that. And, and there's so much to explore with that. And those on the other side, you know, yeah, I was there, part of the Imperial. Just, I want to run my little, <laughs> my little platform in peace. 
And that's the starting point of the character. It's not where they ended up, of course. Yeah, no, absolutely not. So it might be time for a resistance rewatch soon as we're getting into more of this uh, celebrating and discussing this uh, this history of uh, this period of the galaxy, the New Republic, the emergence of the First Order, and uh, all that storytelling that uh, it seems like the Mandoverse is going to explode out into. Great mm-hmm. question about Coruscant, the people there, their uh, changing loyalties over the years. Uh, I would love also just a history of uh, uh, spend some time with some characters actively resisting the first order on Coruscant would be awesome. Any, uh, any final thoughts? Great thought starter of a question. Love it. Yeah. Thank you so much, James. Great question. And we are going to move on to power of the light side. This is a segment uh, where we ask patrons to submit something joyful about star Wars, something they love, a good experience, uh, how it helped them. Uh, if you are a newer patron, uh, just go to the post section, scroll down. You'll see a picture of, uh, of Obi-Wan smiling. Uh, while in lightsaber combat with Darth Vader. Uh, <laughs> and that is where to enter. We have a submission today uh, from Natalie. Here's what Natalie has to say. A love letter to Star Wars 1983 was an important year. Both myself and Return of the Jedi were released to the world. To celebrate the 40th anniversary of my favorite film and my 40th year, I wanted to reflect on some of my early Star Wars memories. I have loved Star Wars as long as I can remember. As a child in the late 80s and early 90s, I used to watch A New Hope, The Empire Strikes Back, and Return of the Jedi over and over again on VHS tapes my parents had recorded from the television. I loved all three films, but Return of the Jedi was always my favorite. It had so many fun and iconic creatures and scenes. There's Jabba the Hutt, Salacious B. Crumb, Max Rebo, the Rancor, and the Sarlacc. And that's just the opening of the film. Mm -hmm. We also find out Luke and Leia are twins. The Empire has created a second Death Star. We get an amazing speeder bike chase through the forests of Endor and are introduced to, in my opinion, the best characters in any Star Wars media to date, the Ewoks. The most heartbreaking scene in the film being the death of Nanta and the Ewok. (laughs) As an adult, it still makes me cry. Uh, Death of Nanta the Ewok, and as an adult, it still makes me cry. To further fuel my love of Ewoks, my parents rented Caravan of Courage, the Battle of Endor, and the animated Ewok series multiple times from our local video store. Princess Nisa from the animated series was a particular favorite of mine. In 1997, something major happened. The special editions of the original trilogy were released at movie theaters. I was so excited. I was going to be able to see Star Wars on the big screen for the first time. My parents took my brothers and I to see all three films at the cinema as they were released. It was an amazing time. It was such a joy to experience the films I loved and had watched so many times at home up on the big screen with surround sound and new effects. I have fond memories of Hoyt's cinema, Star Wars passports. We got stamped as we saw each film and going to McDonald's to get Star Wars toys in our Happy Meals. Even though I can't watch them anymore, having no VHS players, uh, somewhere I still have this special edition VHS box set with the gold box invader on the cover that I saved up uh, my pocket money to buy. As an adult, Star Wars continues to bring me so much joy. Every new movie, television series, and book adds to my love of that galaxy far, far away. I hope that magic is never lost. Mm -hmm. This is great. This is really wonderful. This is just exactly uh, what Natalie said. It's a a love letter to Star Wars, taking us through uh, her journey in Beats. And I have to admit, as I read this, I, I, I kept waiting for the time where like uh, something dipped, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I kept waiting for the twist. We're like, and I had some problems with this special edition. Like, no, Natalie has just shared yeah. the love of Star Wars, the things uh, that brings joy, the happy associations uh, of of times and places and physical objects like that VHS box set. It's absolutely great. Yeah. Uh, Ken, what are your thoughts? Ah, oh, man, I absolutely love this one here, that final sentence. I hope that magic is never lost. It, it never will be for you, Natalie, because I think um, you're looking at it all in, in a very special way. Um, it's easy to get lost along the way. There's so You're so right, Joseph. There's so many times along the timeline here. You, you could have been uh, lost, right? And I think I suffered from um, feeling I had to sometimes step away from that magic. Even, even when I describe what we do sometimes, uh, ran into some old friends lace, lately, right? Hey, what are you up to? How do I explain it? Uh, I talk about <laughs> Star Wars a lot, right? And uh, it, it could be, I think that comes from, uh, and I'm always excited and blessed to do it, but it, in explaining it, it just seems weird. I almost feel guilty. 
But also, I think I, 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 it's like I want to go back and cave into those who, who to- oh, put your toys on the shelf. Stop liking stuff. It's just that silly space saga. You still watch that? All that stuff. We're, we're told that all the way on this journey. And I think it was nice for me to eventually reconnect with it. Never lost the love of Star Wars. But I just felt I had to put a little, little, little uh, you know, a, a little, little, little cover the flame, so to speak. Uh, and now mm-hmm. that you're talking about it is you, you never felt you had to cover the play. Maybe you, you felt you did and you pushed past that and you found mm-hmm. something along the way. Um, four decades of love and Star Wars. It's a, it's a great thing. And, uh, you know, for the Joe Yowses of it all and uh, all <laughs> things along the way, um, it's easy just to, to slam your fist. Ah, it ain't what it was. But look, look for the joy. That's what we do here. So I'll end my, my joyful rant there. <laughs> no, I really, uh, I really relate to that. I, I can't remember if I've mentioned this on the podcast. Uh, this is a couple of years ago now in 2021, uh, went back to hometown of Minneapolis for my friend's uh, bar crawl and was hanging out with some very good friends, uh, two of my friends from high school that I've known forever. And we're talking a little bit about the podcast. Uh, one of them, one of my friends uh, uh, listens um, and they're with the, a third buddy who I didn't know, I uh, like I knew of him and maybe met him once or twice, but like didn't didn't know him. <laughs> mm-hmm. And he was like, wait a minute. So you talk about Star Wars how many times a week? It's like, yeah, usually four. And like, he was like, how? And I was like, do you really want to know? He's like, yeah. So I kind of tried to explain. I'm like, we do this show. We approach it from that. And he's like, and he's like, no, no, you can't. You can't. It's just, <laughs> there's, it's, it's not possible. There's not that much to talk about. It's not possible. <laughs> <laughs> And he might have been a little in his cups, but it was just like that. Like, <laughs> yep, yep. Some yeah. people, you know, uh, yeah. feel that way. And and there, it's, you know, the only limit of things to talk about in Star Wars is, you know, kind of our our, our time to um, read, watch, <laughs> revisit. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, mm-hmm. there's always so much uh, to talk about in terms of ideas and memories. Um, and so much in, in uh, Natalie's uh, piece is, is great because it's a slightly different age than me. You know, mm-hmm. uh, w- I was challenged by the Ewok uh, cartoons when they first came out because of, you know, lots of uh, silly things now. And now I can sit back and enjoy them. So it, it's so great to hear a different perspective. But then there's so much in this that is very much the same. I, I did not save up pocket money for that VHS box set. Um I spent uh, money I was supposed to be spending on college on the that VHS box set, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but I have that same absolute fond memory of the thing itself. I still have that box set, even though, yeah, yeah I'm not going to watch it on VHS, you know, but I mm-hmm. love that box set. It's a symbol of that time and that joy. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, that time, that joy. And it's just there yeah. staring at you. <laughs> exactly. So thank you so much, Natalie. Thank you for everyone uh, for the great questions. Keep uh, uh, being excited about all the new avenues of discussion that are being opened up by the continuing saga of Star Wars. Ken, where can people find us? Hey, you can find us on Twitter at Force Center Pod. Our Facebook page is Force Center Podcast. We're on Instagram as well. And don't forget, as we uh, set up top, we are on YouTube. A lot of cool stuff going over over there and more on the way. So subscribe, hit that notification bell. Podcast is available on ACAST, iHeartRadio, Apple Podcast, and more. Just search, you'll find us. Merch available at tpublic.com slash user slash Force Center. And patreon.com slash Force Center is where you can support us directly, as we said. And you can submit Power of the Light slides like this wonderful one from Natalie today. You can find me at Ken Napsock. Go to my website, kennapsock.com for more, including links to a lot of shows I do, like Cassidy Talk, The Blathering, my YouTube channel where I now stream games there, shorts, videos, more on the way over there as well. Joseph, where can they find you? Yeah, you can find me on all the social media is at Joseph Scrimshaw. I am on Twitter. I am on Instagram. I'm on Mastodon. So come find me if you're interested. You can also check out my YouTube channel. Just search uh, for Joseph Scrimshaw and check out some of the short films and the comedy in the unboxing videos on my YouTube channel. But for now, for myself, for Ken, for that VHS special edition box set, this has been Cues of the Force. Oh, 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 oh,